We are just at the very tail end of our uh, day two of the Pacific Islander Violence Prevention Conference. Um, we are grateful to all of our presenters who were able to participate in the uh, breakouts um, from our Melanesian, Micronesian, and Polynesian communities. So a special thank you to all of those who participated in that. Um, thank you for being in American Samoa, to Guam, to Utah, um, for being able to prepare something so that our participants have some information um, regarding those regions and how to better serve our communities. Um, as you know, <clears throat> our conference is focused on advancing indigenous culture and innovative for transformation impact. And really the purpose of our conference everywhere, every year, is to be able to provide information about the strengths of our communities and how we're able to apply that into the work. Um, and so we're so grateful for all of you from yesterday till today to be who have participated in the conference. Uh, before we <clears throat> engage in our panel discussion today, um, I want to just sort of recap the year 2020. Um, it's been a very challenging year for so many of us, um, not just here, but all over the world. Um, and, you know, ringing in the new year and then shortly after um, receiving the information about COVID-19, pandemic uh, started in March, um, lockdown, shelter in place. Um, that led to really stressing our communities, um, employment, um, social services, nonprofits, all of our institutions were impacted and are still impacted. Um, small businesses, um, people are, were losing their jobs, filing for unemployment, our unemployment system, not as strong as we all thought it was prior to the pandemic. Um, then on May 25th, the death of George Floyd, um, who was the African-American gentleman who was arrested and killed by, while in police custody. Um, that sparked an entire protest all over the nation and globally. Um, and that really began a conversation around what was happening and really brought more attention and much more of a scope to what is already happening in our communities, but really uh, surfaced it even more. Um, and not only that, but we are currently in the middle of a very controversial election um, that's causing a lot of attention, divisiveness. Um, of course, people are uh, very much involved in all of that. Uh, we also have the census. The cent this is a 2020 is a census year every 10 years. As you know, this is the time for the census. Um, and all of these things compounded together has really increased people's anxiety, uh, people's frustration, their anger, sadness, many emotions that we're all experiencing. But what we have seen throughout the media, social media, within our own communities, in our backyards, in our homes, is that there is this enormous amount of civil unrest. And there are still so many questions. So many people are still unsure about what's happening. People are picking sides. People are confused, don't have enough information. Um, and so my organization, um, we are a third party neutral facilitator. And so we are often brought in to facilitate discussions um, where it could be very uh, tumultuous. People are very angry. Um, but really, our um, job is to facilitate very difficult conversations. Um, and so I'm very glad that uh, Susie, PIC2R, and all of our partners there were um, open to having this discussion about civil unrest. Um, I think it's relevant for our community because so many of our young people have been involved and are heavily involved in a lot of different movements. And it is creating um, some tension within the communities 
Um, clearly people have their perspectives, but I think it's always great to be able to have healthy dialogues, even when there's tension. <clears throat> I see conflict as an opportunity and not necessarily something that's negative, but I do believe it is an opportunity for people to all come back together and have a discussion. And if you really think about where you've seen major conflicts, you have to ask yourself, have these people even sat down in one room and had a conversation? Um, and the answer is no. They usually don't ever come together and have a discussion. They're usually in their corner, I'm in my corner, and someone hits the bell, and we just fight. But what I want to do is I always want to create opportunities and a platform for all of us to be able to have healthy conversations, regardless of perspective, but more so to help build our awareness and build empathy for one another. So with that being said, um, I would like to welcome um, our panelists for our panel discussion. Um, and I'm gonna have each of them quickly introduce themselves and the role that they play in the community. And then I'm going to ask a set of questions. Um, they, they were able to hopefully review the questions before coming on today, if not surprised. No, I'm, I'm not gonna do that to you all. Um, but um, I just wanna set some uh, group agreements that we respect each other as we engage in these conversations. Please, again, use I statements and speak from your own experience. I know we are virtual, um, but try your best to please speak one at a time. Um, and it's okay to have differing opinions and perspectives, um, but please try to listen deeply to one another as well as our participants who are here today. Um, and also, um, listen for new ideas and new experiences from your own. Um, and ultimately, no fighting. No, I'm kidding. There's no fighting um, unless you want to hit your keyboard. Um, so with that being said, I want to welcome um, Isieli, oh, Isi, Tausinga, Sete Aulai, Ecolu de Los Santos, Jake Siolo, and Irene Ota to our panel for this afternoon. Thank you and welcome. Uh, to participating. So if you all could just quickly introduce yourself, uh, I'm going to call out your name. Um, and so since Jake, you're on the screen, if you could just quickly uh, introduce yourself and then I'll call out our next panelist. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob Sala Siolo. I'm born and raised here in Utah. Uh, my dad is Billy Siolo. He's from Sabai. Um, but I was born and raised here um, I'm a local activist, I'm very passionate about uh, movements for human rights. Um, I'm very much a pacifist, and so I do believe in peace and harmony. And um, one thing that I've learned from our culture is that family is so important. And so I see struggles of other people, and I see them as our own, and that's kind of what's gotten me so engaged the past few years. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, Jake. Um, Sete, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Sete Aulai. Um, I, I'm honored to be here. I appreciate the invite um, that you guys extended for me to be here. Um, I'm originally from Carson, California. I moved here to Utah in 2005 for college. And then obviously I decided to stay. I uh, am in law enforcement. Um, I work for the Attorney General's office. Um, I began my career um, 10 years ago with West Valley City and um, made the switch over four years ago. And now I'm an investigator for the Attorney General's office in the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. If you guys have never heard of that, basically what I do is I investigate the child trafficking, the sex, child sexual trafficking uh, over the internet or, or wherever it may be, mostly on the internet. But again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, to, to engage in this important discussion. Thank you so much, Sete. Ekolu? Aloha. Uh, my name is Ekolu De Los Santos. Uh, uh, like Sete, um, who is sitting that way. 
Um, I'm a, a special agent with the Attorney General's office, and I work in the same uh, division and task force that SETE is in, uh, Internet Crimes Against Children uh, Task Force. Uh, I don't want to repeat uh, what my colleague has said because he's uh, uh, said it most eloquently, but um, we are busy, uh, unfortunately, busy task force. Uh, I started my career in Davis County, uh, worked in the jail uh, at Davis County, uh, along with uh, also being a fireman and a paramedic up there in the county as well. Uh, I was a deputy sheriff paramedic uh, up in Davis County, and I was the first, I think, Polynesian up on the, in the streets uh, in Davis County. And uh, I think the first paramedic in the state of Utah uh, to be Polynesian. Um, and then uh, went to Woods Cross uh, City Police, uh, worked there as a patrol sergeant. And four years ago, came here with uh, my brother Sete, and uh, we're just fighting the fight. Uh, we appreciate, and I appreciate the, the invite and uh, you know the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Thank you. Thank you, Ecolo. Um, Irene. Hi, um, I'm Irene Ota. Um, I uh, came with my parents from Japan. Um, and moved to Salt Lake when I was two years old. But we did move to Japantown when there was a Japantown. So my growing up in Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, is a little different than growing up in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and um, I just recently retired from the University of Utah after 40 years, um, this last year. And um, 20 of those years were spent um, getting my education, and the other 20 spent um, teaching diversity and social justice and doing um, presentations and, and panels and, and all kinds of social justice work. Um, I have a consulting training uh, business now and I do trainings and consulting about diversity, inclusion and social justice. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, I hope I have something to offer, so thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. And last but not least, EC. Thank you, Melissa, for this opportunity. Uh, you're doing a great job. So uh, my name is uh, Isileli Tupoto Singa. I'm, I'm born and raised in Tonga. I came to the United States when I was 12 years old. Um, I'm a retired law enforcement uh, officer. I started uh, in West Jordan PD in 1986. Um, then transferred to Salt Lake City um, Police Department. I've been there uh, and worked in various division, uh, the intelligence unit, and, and one of the founding members of the Metro Gang Task Force. Uh, I since retired from the law enforcement 13 years ago, and I've uh, become the, the chief uh, of our division for the Salt Lake Legal Defender's Office, where we uh, defend uh, the indigent. Uh, those that have been uh, charged by, by the state, and we give them the best defense. So um, that's, uh, that's what I'm doing right now. So, uh, and I know that uh, we thank the uh, uh, PK2R for, for putting this conference and inviting me back. I thought uh, last time you would just get rid of me for, for being so controversial there, Melissa, but I appreciate Susie. Uh, inviting me back uh, uh, to participate. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, EC. And of course, we're gonna bring you back, brother. Um, so thank you so much for the introductions to our panelists. Um, I'm gonna just ask a few questions and we're just gonna let the conversation kind of flow. Um, so my first question is, um, to set context for our conversation today in your own words, what are you experiencing as it relates to the impacts of the recent national civil unrest um, on our community? So again, you know, what are you experiencing as it relates to the impact of the civil unrest in our community? Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of ping pong it and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna ask um, 
But Kolu, if you could, if you could start us off. Oh, I knew I'd be the first one. I, um, yeah. uh, I think it, uh, I think it affects all of us in a different way, especially if you're in the middle of a civil unrest. And I don't know if, if, you know, you actually look up civil unrest, um, in a dictionary, you know, part of it, uh, part of the, of the definition is civil disobedience. And, um, when uh, myself and my colleagues are in the middle of this civil unrest or civil disobedience, um, it affects us directly. And it affects not only our community as a whole, uh, meaning the Polynesian community, but the way we live and everybody's life. And um, we, we have, looked at and and experienced the type of hate that um you see in the news that is uh that they only uh show on the news and um the things that uh the violence the 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 taunting the 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 acts um i think it's sad i think it's very disturbing especially when you have kids and grandkids like myself growing up and and you know having a son that's that's uh, going to be a, a police officer soon um you worry about stuff like that and for me it's very uh it's very disheartening to see and um uh i don't know uh i don't know if there's a right answer or a wrong answer i think everything is is subject to change but um you said it before anything else is you know, if we sit in a room and start talking to each other and start having universal uh, talks, uh, unconditional love um, uh, with each other, I think uh, I think we can solve a lot of problems that way. Thank you so much, um, Irene. I'd really love to hear uh, kind of your thoughts as probably one of the experts in terms of social justice kind of what have you seen in terms of the impacts on the on the recent national civil unrest well um i can tell you my feelings is yes one of hope and fear so together um hopeful because finally these injustices are are coming into public view and and hope because we're finally getting allies from those in the dominant um identities who have power and privilege in, in society. Not all, but we're getting some. Um, fear because I know that, the, that there has been violence and that civil unrest, civil disobedience doesn't have to be violent, but violence seems to follow. Um, and, and many times the violence doesn't come from those who are, who are practicing um, the civil disobedience or who are um, um, acting um, to bring the unrest to light. Um, there are times when the violence comes from those who want to maintain the status quo um, or want to, want to um, perpetuate and reinforce their dominance. So I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of fear. And I also have skepticism. <laughs> I want to continue. I don't want it to die out. I want the awareness to stay. I want the actions to continue to move forward. Um, I don't want the violence, but then, um, because then the cause gets lost in the violence. So I want the, I want the emphasis to be on the causes. Uh, I'm old, <laughs> and so I remember the 60s and 70s and the civil unrest and the civil disobedience that happened during those times. Um, and so that's where my skepticism comes in, hmm. is, is they raised incredibly important issues. It seemed like we were moving forward, but, it, but then it seemed like we're back to where we were and then this is just this is another peak uh, of awareness that i hope i hope stays so yeah 
that's where I am, a jumble of different emotions. Yeah. Thank you. Jake? Hey. Um, I don't know, this year's been kind of crazy. <laughs> um, I've been big into activism for since the 2016 election. Um, I think just because I was thrown into realizing how politics, even though this movement isn't political or shouldn't be political, I realized how much of it affected me. And so that's kind of what jump started a lot of my activism. Um, but I remember waking up and seeing on Twitter um, that the officer, Derek Chauvin, had knelt on George Floyd's head for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Um, I haven't watched the video and I refuse to watch it. Um, it's something we call like trauma porn and sharing that kind of videos is just only increasing more harm to the African um, American African community. Um, so I try to not watch those videos because I already know what's going to happen. Um, but I remember the first protest here in Utah on May 29th um, and it was truly beautiful, the car caravan, um, there was thousands of people. And over the past six years, four or five years of me being at protests, there's very few young people, very few Pacific Islanders, very few um, people my age out protesting here in Utah. It seemed like it was a lot of the older generation doing the work. Um, but I remember the energy that was in the crowd in Salt Lake City that day. Um, and I had to leave to work around four o'clock and I remember just people texting me, asking me if I was okay, are you safe? And I was so confused. And so then I turned on, looked up on the news on Twitter, and I saw that the cop car was flipped and it was on fire and there was rioting in Salt Lake City. And I was kind of just like overtaken of emotion. I remember calling my mom in the back of my work. It was like a busy Saturday night, I work in a restaurant, but I could not focus on anything just because that was the first protest that I had been to that turned violent. Um, and so that was a lot of emotions for me. Um, but um, ever since George Floyd, I feel like the community here in Utah has grown together. Um, I've met so many Pacific Islanders who have been protesting alongside me. Um, and it's been truly like a beautiful few months, but also super stressful. Um, we've seen political repression for protesters and, you know, we've seen these militia members and these groups that formed in Utah who come out to suppress us using our First Amendment with their Second Amendment rights. So it's really, truly kind of weird and it's kind of like the stuff that we watched in the movies as when we were younger, the civil unrest, um, because it's something so big and kind of like you were saying at the beginning that this issue is so complex. And so it's going to take really creative conversations and creative ideas in order to push this movement further. Um, but yeah, I guess um, I've been out protesting almost every day or any time that I can that I'm not at work. Um, I've kind of made it my second life. <laughs> um, and it's just because um, I remember listening to George Floyd's daughter on his uncle's shoulders and her seeing the protests that were happening because of the death of her father. And she said that her father had changed the world. And I truly do believe that um, because of the death of George Floyd, it really sparked a conversation that needed to happen many, many, many years ago. I mean, it started in the 60s, but we kind of put it under the rug like this country tends to do with a lot of topics. And so I'm really excited to kind of have this conversation with you guys um, about how we can push things forward here in Utah or as a um, community. But. Great. Thanks, Jake. Um, how about you, Sete? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's definitely, uh, at least from a law, law enforcement perspective, it's, um, it's definitely hard. Uh, Ecolo and I are, are not in uniform anymore. We, uh, um, we're strictly just investigations, but nonetheless, we have not left the, the law enforcement world. Um, just like what Brother Ciolo was, was talking about, I, I get it. I, I get the frustration. I get the, the anger with, uh, with what's been 
going on. Um, and I, I completely agree that there is a, a need to, to engage in important, sensitive dialogue about these topics. I get that and I completely agree. From a law enforcement perspective though, it is very hard, it's very hard for guys to put on the uniform and go out there. It's hard. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of fear within, within law enforcement. Um, there's a lot of hesitation uh, within law enforcement. And I, and I get the whole, well, that's what we signed up for. No, no, we signed up to serve our community. I signed up to serve the people of Utah, to serve the Polynesian com uh, community as well. Um, but it is, it is, it's, it's hard um, right now within, within law enforcement, uh, given the, the, the current climate within our, within our country and also with, uh, throughout, throughout the world. Um, but it's, it's something, even though it's hard terrain right now, it's something that we need to go through uh, to be able to find solutions to be able to fix what fix the issues, fix um, what's going on within within our country, and uh, j just since we're all here in Utah, fix what's going on here in Utah. Um, I, I think it's it's important for us to engage in those kinds of conversations. Yeah. Thank you, Senator EC. Oh, thank you. Um, we we certainly live in in a different era. Uh, a different time, uh, as we all witness the, uh, the the frustration and the anger is what we're talking about towards um, politics and towards laws and policy. And um, my experience uh, being on the on the other side of law enforcement for 22 years, uh, retired from there. Now I'm on the defense side, on the other side of the fence, um, defending those uh, who who've been charge and have done uh, wrong things to our community. Um, you know, when I, when I witnessed what happened to Floyd, um, that really stirred up emotions, all different emotions in all of us, um, including my, myself. And I, oh, it's almost as if to embrace ourselves of what's coming uh, and what's next. And, um, but, but I think we, 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 we can't have a, a, a peaceful protest and an, an unrest, um, civil unrest, and expect to have uh, a meaningful dialogue for change in the laws and, and policies. Uh, we, we have to find a better way to, to, to negotiate. And, and I appreciate Jake's honesty. Uh, about addressing this here. And these issues that, that we see it impacts our community. Uh, for me, for once on the other side of the fence, I see the mass incarceration that are affecting our young people, our own people. And, and so that's in the criminal justice system. And, and I think we've all experienced, maybe experienced our, how we have been treated as, as a people as Pacifica Islander in, in our community, in, in our society, in institution, even in our employment, we have experienced the, the type of things that we see uh, are treated with, with other people of color. And so, but um, uh, that's, that's what I, I, I see what's happening and we, we just have to find a better way. Uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, and so um, thanks for this opportunity just to give my two cents in. No, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, all of you have sort of uh, said different things. Um, actually, you've all said the same thing in different ways, because I do feel that there is this need to have more dialogue and meaningful dialogue. But how do we have those dialogues when we can't suspend how we feel, right? Because we're going to come ready to say what we want to say and how we feel because it's been our experience or we've adopted the experiences of others through empathy. Um, and so I just want to thank you all for being very honest um, in case for you participants who haven't really recognized 
I intentionally wanted to bring different perspectives to this conversation. I mean, it would be easy if everybody was a cop or if everybody was a community organizer. But like I said, I'm kind of like a firewoman. I like to run to the fire and I like to have these conversations. And so thank you for your honesty. Um, and I think that that's where we start is, is, is if we speak from our own experience and we share how we really feel. Um, one of the things that I have seen both in conversation in community and on social media is that Pacific Islanders somehow feel disconnected to what's happening in the world. It's not my issue. I'm not black. Um, dang, that's messed up what happened to him, but you know, maybe he wasn't, maybe he wasn't listening to the cop and that's why he's in that situation or, um, oh, it's just another, it's just another black guy who's causing crime and that's why we got to get him. So I've, I've heard the gamut of it all. Um, and so my question to a few of you um, is really, what do you feel like your role is as a Pacific Islander? Um, and Auntie Irene, you're, you're adopted to the whole Pacific Islander situation. So um, I'd love to also hear from you is, what, how do you feel like you as a Pacific Islander play a role in sort of this larger conversation? Um, around the work because there's Black Lives Matters, there's different organizations um, that have either been asleep and have woken up or they've organized um, or they've been part of the conversation for a long time. But as Pacific Islanders, of course, we still make a very small percentage of the US population. However, we are very uh, but we are very much in these areas where it's heavily populated by different ethnicities and different communities, including the African American community. So I just want to ask, um, and I'll and I'll start with you, um, EC, um, as a Pacific Islander, how do you see your uh, your ethnicity playing a role in this larger dialogue around race and equity? Thanks, Melissa. I, I I believe that. Um, we have the ability as a people to get involved um, in legislature, uh, in policy uh, makers, in position where we can make a difference, where we can use our own lenses as we look at the laws and we look at the policy, uh, how it affects us as, as a people. So um, I, I feel that we, we probably need to train our younger generation to learn how to lobby and, and to go out there and, and learn the art of lobbying. Uh, that's where the real change uh, happens. Uh, and that will affect all of us as, as, as Pacific Islanders. And so uh, we can certainly have uh, the, the opportunity to, to make changes. And, um, and I, I'm hopeful that our younger generation are, are, are very are smart and they have the, the potential uh, the social skills, uh, the, the, the passion to, to get involved. I see many of our young people are running for office uh, in their community, uh, participating in, in the process and learning the process. I think that's where, where we need to, to get more involved. Uh, there, there is invitations for, for our community here in Utah to get involved in, in policy making, in, in committees that, that can change the community, that impact. I think there's argument that, that some are saying that it's hard to get into those communities, but I think we need to be consistent uh, about getting involved. Um, and so that's, that's what I, my belief is. And, um, and, and yeah. Yeah. So really, uh, as Pacific Islanders, right, we have, we live in America where anybody can run for office. If, if you are a citizen, you have the opportunity to run for office. But if you're not, a citizen, you also have uh, the opportunity to be civically engaged, right? And so running for local office, participating in uh, local elections, lobbying for different policies that you really are passionate about. So really speaking to that in terms of ways that us as Pacific Islanders can be more um, contributors to the national dialogue. So thank and you. Go, and to go and vote. 
Go and vote. Yes, absolutely. So in the state of Utah, there's roughly 50,000 Pacific Islanders in the state of Utah, right? Um, and I think in the last formal ACS estimate was 48K, but that was in 2018. Now we're in the middle of the census. Utah has the largest population of Pacific Islanders than any other city in the US. It used to be the Bay. It used to be where I'm from. Um, but a lot of them have now migrated to Utah. So, I mean, I just, I'm just trying to put this all in context for you all. So how about you, uh, Jake? What do you think um, as a Pacific Islander and sort of how do we fit into this national dialogue? Yeah, um, I don't know, I felt, um, <clears throat> so my parents were divorced when I was eight years old. Um, my mom is white. Um, and so I feel as if I was a little, you know, I didn't learn a lot of the cultural things that I feel like I should have just with an absent father. Um, and so just through getting involved with like my community, our community, especially working for um, justice and like behind all these different kind of movements, it's really brought me to my roots as then re helping me realize who I am and the voice I can use as a Polynesian here in Utah to inspire many, many more here in Utah. Just like you said, the 50,000 Polynesians here in Utah. Um, I hope to be someone that they can look at, that a little kid can look at me and be like, oh, like I can do this. Um, I'm so inspired by like Opa who ran for Congress here in Utah. Um, it's people like that, that we can look forward to, look, look to in our community. Um, because once we're represented, I feel like we're not actually represented here in Utah fully um, because we don't have the energy. I feel like we're lacking of representation here in Utah uh, when we should be the opposite. Um, but yeah, I think just as Pacific Islanders, um, I feel like sometimes even I growing up had a lot of, I felt a lot of privilege. And so I didn't see myself as this marginalized group or I hadn't experienced police brutality or any type of racism until I really sat down and realized how much it actually does affect me. Um, I think one of my biggest inspirations are the Polynesian Panthers that started in New Zealand um, when all of the Samoan and Tongan immigrants came to New Zealand. Um, I remember I was just reading some of the articles this morning about people's experiences then and the fact that they couldn't even walk out the door without being cursed at, called something degrading because of who they are, because they were different, they were a minority in the community. Um, and so the story of the Polynesian Panthers and how it started and that they wanted a better life for their community, um, I took a lot of that to heart. And that's kind of why I feel so passionate um, about doing what I'm doing. Um, I was a theater arts major for two years. I set that aside and switched to political science. Um, so my focus is um, peace and justice. Um, in Utah, um, since 2013 to 2019, Utah had the highest police killings in all of the United States. So it frustrates me <laughs> that sometimes when we watch the news and the conversations that I'm hearing going in through the community are, that it doesn't really affect us, that, oh, he was just a criminal. But we really need to realize that it's such a problem here in Salt Lake City, in all of Utah, that it's important that we use our voices because we all have someone that wants to listen. And like, unless we're ready to have these conversations and do the work, nothing's gonna be done. Thank you, Jake. So Jake, really uh, touching on, you know, sort of you and your identity, right? And um, learning as you're going through your process and the journey, especially with what's happening in the nation, that you've been able to actually reach back into your roots. Um, and then um, talking about sort of um, the example that you wanna be that anyone can get civically engaged or participate in different movements. Um, you wanna be an example to younger generations that they can also do it. And I really love um, 
that you brought up the Polynesian Panthers. I don't think that there's a lot of people who know about the Polynesian Panthers, but that that was a very important movement, especially at that time. And now that we're here, um, a lot of that work is still relevant. So thank you for sharing. Um, I wanted to go to you, uh, Sete, and sort of, um, you actually touched this, touched on this a little bit earlier um, when you were talking about being Polynesian and wanting to serve. And I just kind of want to come back to that with you around, um, you know, being Polynesian and being in law enforcement, right? Um, at the end of the day, um, your, your, your paint job is still Polynesian. And so um, I just want you to talk a little bit about that um, and how, how it's impacting you. And, and sort of your role as Pacific Islander law enforcement in this larger conversation? Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the question. Um, let, me, let me just set the stage. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for my, uh, uh, my great grandmother who decided to move to the States from, uh, from Samoa uh, back in the 60s. Um, that I, I believe what she did, um, and then ultimately my, my grandparents and then my parents, uh, that, that led me to be where I am. They, they moved from, uh, from uh, Kukuila, American Samoa, to, to Carson, California. And there is a reason why I am sitting where I'm sitting. I, I just didn't become a cop just to become a cop, right? Um, in, in Carson or in LA, uh, there's, there's, a, there, there's a lot of difficulty in, in LA, even still, and that there's there's no difference from when I from when I grew up um, there. Um, I remember growing up, and I saw two of my uncles who were who were shot and killed by LAPD in the early 90s. My grandma was one of the ones who who decided to go with all the five elves, uh, the pastors, um, and march um, in the streets for for justice for for the killings of my my two uncles. Um, now, I, I looked at that um, as, I, as I grew up and, and thought about what I wanted to do. Um, I, I looked at that and asked myself, what, what do I, what, what, what am I wanting to do here? Um, that was seeing that and seeing other things um, in LA kind of pushed me to where I am today. Um, I'm in law enforcement to serve. Um, I, I am here to serve my community. I'm here to serve the, 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 the people of Utah. Um, education is, is, is important, is key in all of this. And, and knowing, what, um, no, knowing what's going on and how you can, how you can use your voice, uh, your education to, um, to make the change that's necessary um, in whatever community you're in, whatever state you're in. Um, so that, that, that was kind of the thing that pushed me to, to get to where I am today. I believe, I, I myself have never really experienced uh, racism here in Utah. I mean, even being in law enforcement here in Utah, this is a predominantly white profession. Um, but I don't, I, I'm not speaking for Ekolu, but at least for me, I, I haven't I haven't experienced that. Rather, I have been looked at as a as a um, kind of a bridge uh, between what they're looking for and the the Polynesian community. That's how I've been um, been looked at as as a voice for the Polynesian community. I've been asked numerous times, what it, what is it? How can we better engage with with Polynesian communities? Because, like you said, there's there's a lot of us here. Um, and so I've been I've been used um, in that aspect within within law enforcement here um, in in Utah. So um, I, I hope that answers what you were. What you yeah, were. no, no, no. I mean, definitely, just in terms of you personally in your story around, you know, your your uncles um, being killed by law enforcement, and then your um, your family marching right for justice. And that really led to you really thinking about your future um, and that you chose law enforcement because you want to serve the community, right? And so you took a situation that potentially could have completely derailed your trajectory um, into something else, but you chose to 
um, to change that narrative. And, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but um, to really be someone that was able to serve the community. And that sounds like that's really at the core of who you are. Um, and so I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And um, law enforcement is not an easy job. And we know that even right now, it's probably um, one of the most critical um, professions that has a very, very tight lens on. Um, and so I just appreciate you and your honesty. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to ask another question, and I'm going to start with you, Ekolu, um, who's sitting right there next to you. Um, uh, I want to just say, um, how, ha how do you think the Pacific Islander community, Polynesian community, if you will, how, how do you think that our community is uniquely positioned to influence reconciliation around issues of racial equity. And I want to preface that because there's a very small, um, there's still a small African American community in Utah. And I think over the past 10, 15 years, it's increased by many. But for a long time, uh, Pacific Islanders were, um, alongside with the Latinos and Native Americans, were predominantly the people of color, especially in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, and, and neighboring areas uh, within the valley. So, um, yes, we talked about, like, civil engagement, but I also just want to hear from you, Ikolu, what you think, like, how are we uniquely positioned to influence some of this reconciliation that needs to happen um, around racial equity and community policing? Um, I think a lot of, a lot of the things that I say comes up from the upbringing that I've, I've been, uh, blessed with. I was born and raised on Oahu. Um, I was, uh, blessed to go to, uh, good institutions, good schools, learned a lot. Um, and if you are in Honolulu, which I was, I was born and raised in, um, it's not, predominantly Polynesian there, or Hawaiian. Um, I, I look around the Hawaiian community here in Utah, and it's minute, very small. Um, I am Samoan as well. Um, and uh, my ancestors and my, the, the people that uh, I represent are my main force of why I do what I do. So, um, uh, my Samoan ancestors uh, came to this valley uh, and was one of the uh, first uh, settlers in uh, the town of Iosepa. And uh, that's where my roots uh, come from. And I'm very proud uh, to, do, to be uh, associated with them, which means uh, for me as a, as a Polynesian uh, individual, uh, how we can have influence in our community. First, it, uh, it it starts at home, and if if I if I go out and and I wouldn't say preach, but tell people what to do, what to believe, what to to do, uh, and and my my home is chaos, then. Um, I should I should fix my own home before I talk to other people about fixing theirs. Um, our influence would be very very huge. Uh, I've been involved in in uh, uh, Polynesian get-togethers where you have uh, programs and things that the Polynesian community can be a part of to learn uh, about the civil beat of this city, this, this state, and nobody comes. Um, uh, you have something like this. Uh, I have uh, family members from, from Hawaii that are asking me about this national uh, get together on civil unrest and nobody knows about it back home in Hawaii. Um, or if they are just a little bit. Um, so I think, uh, you know, to be vocal, more vocal about it is definitely a bigger part of what we need to do as a community uh, to get the people that are at home that don't want to be involved to be involved because sooner or later, your kids, 
your grandkids, your family, if you stay here, are going to be involved in things that you do and you do not do. And uh, I rather my kids be involved in a state in which I took part of uh, trying to make it better than not doing anything at all. Um, but like I said, it all it all starts in the home. And if you if you you know teach your kids and do what you need to do in the home, uh, the love should spread, and uh, uh, your kids will be a voice for you as well. So, yeah, that's that's uh, my two cents. Yeah. So you're really talking about reconciliation starting inward, outward, right? So starting Absolutely. at home, um, starting with the family, um, and that you know, your hope is that um, your children or your posterity is going to reflect some of the things that you were a part of in terms of um, how to be and, and contributing that to um, really focusing on home. And so you said, uh, you know, it's hard for me to go out and tell people what to do if I can't even do it in my own home, right? So yeah, if we, if, if we look at the, the, the current situation now, and, it's, and, and like I said, I, I, uh, Sete and I, We've been on the street and and have done uh, the things that uh, you know, the police officers are doing now. But when we get called to homes, when we get called to even Polynesian homes, um, and you know, a lot of the the problems or a lot of the things start from there, and that's where we want to you know make sure that the foundation is solid uh, for them to grow out. The, the roots have to be solid. And if it's not solid, then, you know, it's not gonna grow or it's not gonna grow straight. So, you know, we've been there, we've done that. And, you know, that's, that's just part of a, a small little part of the puzzle, so. Great, thank you. Um, EC, what do you think in terms of how is our um, community uniquely positioned to influence reconciliation around issues of racial equity. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think as a community, Pacific Islanders, I think we have the, the social skills and the gift to influence people. Um, and, and we have to start, and we do have this gift of, of, of practicing inclusion, and compassion uh, towards all people. And we start that by at home and families, like our two law enforcement officers, brothers are saying, starts at home and extend to our neighbors and religious affiliation and our coworkers and how we, uh, how we treat those around us, even those that we supervise and that we lead in, in this community. So we have the influence we, we can have, we have that as, as a community. Everyone can influence others. You look at our youth, our young people in high school, in elementary, they are true leaders. Uh, everybody kind of just follows those the Pacific Islanders in, in the high school. And because they have that influence to make a difference in all of, of the kids that they associate with in junior high or in high school, because they are so compassionate and they include everybody. So we have when when I was a when I was a, a stake president, um, I was over a, a stake of multi uh, culture on our. It was very mixed, not only Tongans and Samoans, but Hispanics and and blacks. And we were in. Were, they came because we were so inclusive because we knew how to love them and. Um, we were just so kind in treating them that they just came, even the white folks. I, I, as a state president, I told them, you need to go back to your own ward. And I felt so bad because they did not want to because they wanted to, to come and be with us and because they felt loved and they felt included. So as a community, we know how to influence other people and to, to lead and, and look at our young people. That's who I have hope uh, in, among them. And so uh, those, those are my thoughts, that the future leaders is our younger generation. That's where I'm, my hope is. Uh, yeah. 
So, and, and I think you, you actually have a very uh, unique position that you've had the opportunity to serve in different capacities. So you've seen, um, you know, oversaw an entire stake for those of you who are not members of the LDS faith, that is sort of a regional president over multiple congregations. Um, and so you actually were able to see multicultural individuals, but what stood out for you is the young people. And, and the children because their minds are still very fresh, right? So they're all inclusive because they don't know anything else. Um, sort of the behaviors when they start to get divisive, they start to learn as they grow up, right? So um, if we can continue to really um, impact our young people to think that way um, so that they, that's just kind of stapled into who they are and what they think, then when they grow up, they're still gonna have that. And, and you know all of the negative influences of stereotypes and things like that don't really impact them so thank you for sharing that i want to also ask you jake um you know um how do you think we as a community can uniquely is uniquely positioned to influence reconciliation um and i know that you are sort of on the front lines as well in terms of uh, protests and different movements that you're a part of, but you as a Pacific Islander, um, you know, how do you think that we can influence the reconciliation? Um, first of all, I really love what Isu was saying about the influence that we have as Pacific Islanders, and I feel like that's 100% true. Um, a lot of times after I'll like speak at a protest or an event, um, that's kind of what most people will say, that there's just this like, intuition this inclusiveness about me and i know that a lot of that comes from our culture and what i've been taught and i've been taught to love one another i've been taught to love my neighbor no matter who they are um kind of going back to the polynesian panthers that they they started the polynesian panthers in response to the black panthers that was started here in the united states in the civil rights movement and a lot of the injustices that the black community go through, we also go through not the same, but we experience a lot of the same stereotypes and things like that in our community. And so just because we don't have the same struggles as the black community, we their struggles should be our struggles. And so we need to be having those conversations with one another and make this topic about humanity because too often it's pulled to politics, too often it's pulled to, well, blue lives matter, no, all lives matter, black lives matter, but it, none of it should be a debate. But what I've noticed in this country is that anything that has to do with human rights and equality is a debate. If a man can get married to a man, it's a debate. If a woman should have control over her body, it's a debate. You know, if science is real, if climate change is real, it's a debate. So there's so many <laughs> debates that are going on. And a lot of it is happening because I feel like people don't actually reach out and have conversations. And so I'm really enjoying this conversation that we're all having. Um, because I think a lot of people just see the Black Lives Matter as a movement. And they don't really see the people that it's affecting. That the Black Lives Matter is about millions and millions of Americans who have had to deal with this for 400 plus years. And like I said earlier, I feel like this country has never actually owned up to the fact that they mistreated the African American community so poorly. And so it stresses me out and makes me angry when people deny the fact that um, Black Lives Matter, because in reality, we, we've watched the past 400 years that black lives don't actually matter to America. And so going back to the community, over the past few months, it's been truly beautiful to see the community come together. Um, I've met so many people and had so many great conversations. Um, I know a lot of people that want to abolish the police. Um, I'm more of like a reformist, and so I'm here for like police reform. And a lot of the black leaders here in Utah, the leading the chapters here in Utah, are all for reform. And so it's been cool to kind of join these conversations, um, but it's important because I feel like us as Pacific Islanders, we need to use our perspective. Um, and just another like quick statistic. So there was, there was a poll that was done and over 30% of the Pacific Islanders here in Utah 
experience racism. And at least three fourths of those experience racism in healthcare. And so then you kind of like pull like this whole COVID pandemic and then you realize that, you know, the Polynesians are the most affected here in Utah. And then now that's playing into racism. And you also see the hate crimes go up towards um, Ameri Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, all because we had a president that called it a Chinese flu. And so it's kind of interesting to see the, this movement playing also into this pandemic and realizing that racism is an actual problem here in Utah. In 2017, I was pulled over for speeding in Beaver County. I was going to St. George to visit my family. I was going like, I was speeding. I was going probably like 15 over and I understand that I was speeding. I was breaking the law. Um, but when I was pulled over, um, an officer um, walked up to my car. I had a Black Lives Matter sticker on the rear end of my car. Um, he asked for my license and registration, went back to his car, came back. He pulled me out of my car, took me 20 feet from my car, yelled at me, spit in my face, basically saying that I'm just here to create crime, that I'm never learning, and all this kind of stuff. And he wouldn't actually let me talk. And so that was kind of one of my first experiences. And I've had a lot of experiences since living up in Utah Valley um, of being pulled over with friends and the cop tells us that our license and registration is not valid and I pull out the license and registration and it's valid. Um, so I don't know, I feel like there's a 30% of Pacific Islanders here in Utah that are experiencing racism and experiencing it in healthcare situations. So I feel like it's really a topic that we need to talk about. And so I don't know, maybe there's more forums or weekly things or something that we can really address these issues and how, because um, in reality, once, if we all work together, um, that's how Black lives will matter. Um, but until then, until we all get involved, until we all have these conversations together as a family, like all of you said, um, I really do believe that it starts within ourselves and then our community and our friends and our families. And that's really what we're like, propel it um so yeah i feel like just using our naturally born like intuition and love and the family aspect of this culture is something that is so beautiful and um i feel like we shouldn't be turning a blind eye to this movement uh, and that we should be amplifying black voices and protecting black women and doing everything that we can to further their movement because in reality, none of us would have any rights without the work that the black community put in. Me as a gay man would not be able to marry who I want to if it wasn't for the black trans women that threw the first stones at Stonewall, that those riots that started and really it really started that equal rights movement. And so I feel like we owe it a lot to the African-American community to help them to show, to prove to one another, to prove to this world that Black lives do matter and that they have a whole 50,000 Pacific Islanders here in Utah standing right beside them. Whether, no matter what your political affiliation is or anything, whether you're a cop or you're not, them knowing that they have support is gonna mean so much to them. And I feel like we need to have those conversations with the Black people in our community. And I've learned so much from talking to Black leaders and the, the stories that they're telling me and the experiences, it's really changed so much of my perspective. So I would reach out to all of you to also tell you that if you have been, have those conversations with the community here, the African community here in Utah, um, because they are drastically affected by this movement, by the pandemic, by everything that's going on in this of unrest. But sorry, I just rambled. <laughs> oh, that's okay, Jake. Spoken like a real activist. Um, there, there was a lot you said there. It's a lot to unpack. Um, but ultimately, you're, you 
are very nestled in the fact that you're a Pacific Islander and that thought of inclusivity and peace building and um, just that influence alone could really contribute to like this larger conversation. Um, I also heard you mention a lot about the different movements um, and how you very much feel that um, that there needs to be a reconciliation about the African American community and that their role that they've played in the historical context of these national conversations. Um, and that um, you really would love for people to have these dialogues with African Americans about their experience so that they could maybe understand a little bit more. Um, and that also your feeling is that their lives do matter, that black lives do matter. And because of their contribution and their sacrifice to the history of this country, um, that a lot of the work that we're able to do and the different responsibilities and opportunities that we have now are because we stand on the shoulders of those sacrifices. So thank you so much. Um, for that. Um, I'm going to wrap up our conversation a little bit and I and I want to definitely have a safe landing because I know I like just kind of open it up and now we're hecka deep into it and I also have to be a good facilitator and keep everybody on time. But I, I do definitely um, want to ask, you know, what does it look like for our community um, as Pacific Islanders um, in terms of racial equity? Um, and I know that there is a lot of there's a, there's a lot of different things that's happening in Utah that's not happening anywhere else. Like all of us in California are like super jealous of all of the like uh, Pacific Islander uh, focused education systems that you have and a lot of these different movements that you have. Um, there's like therapists in Utah that are Pacific Islander. There's so many Pacific Islanders and academia, right? And so you all in Utah have a very unique position in terms of the way that Pacific Islanders are going to influence the national conversation. Right, and so I really would love to know from all of you, what does that look like for our, our community in the future? And I actually would like to start with Irene. Irene, um, I know that you've been in academia and that you are at the forefront of social justice and you have <laughs> historical context and the expertise, um, but from your perspective, um, how do you think Pacific Islanders can really um, play a role in the future of, of this conversation and the dialogue? Well, I'm going to speak more broadly and I'm going to uh, speak to what Jake said as well as that Black Lives Matter. Yes, it puts a focus on that Black Lives didn't matter and that they should matter. But the conversation around Black Lives Matter is also brought up um, injustices, historical injustices against all people of color and all different kinds of oppressed identities. So now we have, instead of POC for people of color, we have BIPOC, BIPOC. We have Black Indigenous people of color. Because now we're really looking at our history of, of how the, we oppressed with violence um, and genocide against our Indigenous populations. And I'm going to say that racism impacts all people of color. You're not safe because you're Pacific Islander and you're not Black or you're not Latinx, or you're not indigenous, you are a person of color and you are going to face racism, whether you know it or not, whether it's indirect, whether it's implicit, whether it's direct, whether it's unconscious, you, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The research shows it. And the research is here in Utah that shows it against the Pacific Islander population. So an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere, right? Martin Luther King. So just understand that if you don't address the racism that exists for someone else, then you're not even addressing the racism that exists for you. It exists. It's just there. How do you get your voice at the table? Civil unrest and civil disobedience. That is the way we hear the voices. Why do you think we're having the conversations we're having now? Because of civil unrest. And it's happened way before the 1960s. The, the enslavement and kidnapping of Africans in, into the institution of slavery. Do you think all those slaves were complacent, happy? No, no. There were rebellions from the get-go, right? 
the, the Latinx voice has always been strong, the Asian voice. However, not all these voices are heard, respected, or even, even considered because of the power differentials. And to say we have to get away from politics is gonna be impossible. Everything is politics. Everything is political. Racialized identities, politicized to say, to maintain who would get the power and economic goodies. Exactly why they were created. Political, about power and money. And so you want your voice heard, you've got to raise your voice. Okay. And when you get to the table, don't just be the superficial um, kumbaya picture of, look, we got a brown person at the table. You've got to insist that your voice be heard. Um, D.L. Stewart was a Westminster um, equity speaker, and he said, you, you can have all the people of color at the table if you want to, but if they're not heard, if they're not respected, you have, then you're just there for, for window dressing. Make your voice heard. And it's not always going to sound nice. And yes, you're going to be called the angry person of color. But you have every, we have every right to be angry. Let us be angry. We don't have to be violent. But let us be angry. So that's all I'm going to say. Oh, I, the other thing I'm going to say is that what happens in homes and communities is a direct reflection of what happens in communities. The oppression that happens to people in a community trickles down to what happens in a home. Economic strife, racial strife, patriarchal <laughs> implications, unhealthy masculinity, it trickles down into the home. So it's not just the home, it's what's happening in the community as well that impacts what happens in the home. It goes both ways. Mm. <clears throat> I need to take my class. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. Um, we all get hot when we get passionate. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, Sete, um, to you, what, what does our future look like for Pacific Islanders in, in this whole conversation of reconciliation? I, I, I really appreciated Irene's remarks. Um, it, it's good to hear. Um, it's good to hear that. I, um, I, I appreciated that. But it, it's nothing different from what has already been said starting within the home um, and then and then trickling out to the community and then further on from there. Um, I, <clears throat> racism is gonna, it's gonna happen. It, it, it's there, wherever, wherever you are in, the, in, in this country, just like what I, Irene said, you're gonna, we're gonna run into it. And it's not just with people of color, white people experience it too. Um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna leave them out. They're, they're gonna experience it too. So it, that's just what, that, that's just that's just how it is. Um, but within within the Polynesian community, we are we're, we're just natural born leaders. We're we're sort of say lovers, which is why people gravitate towards us. Uh, people they 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 love our our the the love that we um, that we show all the time, which is um, which is why they they gravitate us. I think I think with within all of this, love is gonna is gonna matter the most with with uh, with trying to move forward. Even though we're gonna have all these uncomfortable uh, conversations, it's good. It's okay. But do it civilly, respectfully, and with love. And I, and I think with all of that, you're gonna um, unfortunately you're you're gonna you're gonna ultimately get to 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 where you want. We can have these conversations all we want. We can we can engage in these kinds of dialogues all we want. Acting on it is is, is what's going to matter. Actually doing it is is what's going to is what's going to matter. Not not just sitting at the table, looking good, um, but acting on it and 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 and, and trying to make it, make make a difference within that. I love being in this country. Being in this being in this country it allows us to, to have these kinds of conversations with, with each individual uh, community, right? I love, I love the freedom that, that, we, that we have. There's a reason why my great grandma moved here from American Samoa is in, in order for me to have that, that kind of freedom. I, I, love, I, I love what this country has to offer. There's a, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of a dirt back there within within this country's history okay i get that um 
but I don't, I don't think it, it does us any good to keep looking back and referring back to it. Let's, let's learn from those things rather and move forward to try to better not only our community, but this nation and then ultimately this world. Um, the slavery thing, I get it. Yeah, I get that. I, I get that that happened. Every culture went through slavery. The blacks, the Samoans, the Tanyans, we, every culture went through that. I get, I get that. Learn from it though, and move forward. There's, I, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that there's a that you've got to keep going, going, going back to it. Um, the Black Lives Matter, of course, Black Lives Matter. I think everyone can agree with that. I think everyone can agree with the sentiment of 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 that. Um, and I'm grateful for for the Black community with with the, their leadership and because it's helped us as as Polynesians. Um, but th that's also another conversation, uncomfortable conversation that, that we need to have to try to help their community. Because again, like I just said, it'll, it'll help ours. But at the end of the day, uh, to answer your, I, I know I'm, I'm just rambling on Melissa, but okay. love, love, love is what, is what matters here. Engage in these difficult, uncomfortable conversations. Let's do it. Act on it civilly, respectfully with love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. EC, what does our future look like? Um, you know, we, this is a process. I think that there are not just one way of approach. There are many ways to approach our, the, the conflict and the situation. I, I think as a community, uh, we need to see the, the, the Black experience as an, an extension of our experience um, as a community. Uh, and I have family members who is extended uh, to that, but have disconnected um, from, from them because of, of political division. And that heart's sad to, to, to have that, to see that within, you know, within families uh, because of the political division. Um, I, 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 I think Irene, she really, hit it right there. Irene, thank you so much. And I think we should be able to be open-minded of, of what's happening in the reality of the system uh, that we experience, the systemic uh, inequality in our, uh, in our institution, and we have to address it. Um, but hopefully that we do it in the most peaceful way and, and not to hurt anybody and to harm anyone. I hate to see that, to, to harm somebody else. Uh, but there is a way, that there's different ways to, to approach and, and address these issues because it affects us. Um, even, even as we uh, struggle through uh, this, this time, I think there's, there's better time ahead. And, and I think uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep swinging at it and work at it. And, and so there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Jake, briefly to you, and then Nicolu, and then I'm going to wrap this up. What does our future look like, Jake? Um, I don't know. I remember, I really liked Irene's first comment that she said earlier, um, that she was very hopeful and fearful. And, you know, with this controversial election and a lot of things that are hanging in the balance, it's easy to get fearful, fearful of, oh, maybe a civil war starting or, you know, something like that. Um, but I try to look out every day, um, just being hopeful. Um, and it's been really hard over the past few months. Um, I was at a protest in Provo, Utah that turned violent. I remained peaceful. There was multiple vehicles running through us, running over us. Many didn't have license plates, nothing, not on the front or back. The police statements say that they were going to a specific point or they were going in a certain direction, but there's not actually. All of like, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, I was wrongfully accused for using my First Amendment right. And um, I had been served um, for rioting. Um, Provo Police Department, they agreed to not arrest and book me because they knew that they didn't really have much on me, um, other than the fact that I had spoken at that event, um, 
but I have been to 500 protests and have remained peaceful. And um, a few, about two, three weeks ago, I already had a court date. And um, so I'd already been served. And I lost my wallet at the Draper Dog Park. And I got a phone call that evening that it was from the Draper police chief. And he said that he had found my wallet. And I was like, OK, great. Um, I can come get it. And he said, OK, well, you, I was, but I had an event that I was going to. And so I told him, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it. Um, but he said, oh, if you don't come, I'm gonna, we're going to have to book your wallet into evidence, and it's going to be a process to get it out. So I said, sure, I'll come pick up my wallet. I, me, as seeing a sort of privilege that I had, or trusting that I wouldn't be deemed as a threat as a Polynesian here in Utah, was wrong that when I showed up to the Draper Police Department, they had 20 officers waiting to arrest me. They had no clue what they were arresting me for other than the fact that the girl that turned in my wallet said that she Googled me or Facebooked me and she saw that my profile said, defund the police, that I'm an active protester and that they should be warned. And so I really love the fact that Irene said that racism exists and we need to not deny it. Um, and I disagree that we need to not look back at slavery and the things that happened in this country, because the things that are happening right now are because of what happened hundreds of years ago, 50 years ago. That's why we look to history and we're like, oh, that's why this, these communities are being treated horribly. It's because of what some of the things that were founded when this country was founded. Um, but anyways, I kind of felt like um, a little scattered in the head. Um, but overall, it's been hard to remain hopeful, um, to go out every day and yell for equality. It's stressful, it's tiring. I don't know if you've seen Capitol Hill in Salt Lake, but that hill is very high and I, it's, it's a workout walking up every day, but it's worth it. And one of my favorite quotes is that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. And so the second that we become hopeless, the second that we listen to all these outside sources or we listen to um, anything, I think we just seem to remain hopeful and loving um, because that's really what this movement is. It's a movement about love. Every person in the street that's protesting is doing it out of love. And just like what he said earlier, love is the answer. Um, but yeah, I hope that made sense. <laughs> Thank you. Nicolu, our future. Oh, Jesus. Um, all right, since I'm the last one, I'm not going to take up much of your time, but I am going to say some things that uh, I truly believe in. Number one, I back up my boy, uh, Sete, when he says not to look back, but to look ahead. I don't think he was referring to, you know, we don't have to look back. I think uh, I'm a history buff as well. And history, yeah, we have to have that. And in today's society, we are erasing history when it comes to all of the, uh, the, the when it comes to the violence of protests, when they're taking down statues and things like that. I am totally fine. If you have issues with uh, uh, Confederacy, this, that, slavery, the whole works, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, but when we erase it and take it down, I think it needs to be uh, put in a museum and have our kids uh, look at it and learn from it. Uh, when we look back at the things that are um, affecting us today, yeah, it is the history of this country that we have to learn from. And because we're making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And when we erase them, we're not gonna learn from them. We're just gonna keep on making them. Um, how, I feel about, uh, how I feel about this culture moving forward, um, we need to have uh, communication and dialogue, but it has to be based on the Aloha spirit the the 
the spirit that we have graciously been given uh, to the Polynesian people that nobody else has, um, that we can go ahead and, and influence people. Um, and I totally agree with uh, Sister Irene um, with her comments on, you know, when we have to be angry about things, be angry, but be peaceful. Um, it doesn't say any place, I don't think, in the Constitution, uh, anywhere that says protest. I think it says uh, peacefully assemble. Um, uh, if I'm wrong, please tell me. But um, Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., peacefully assembled. Didn't burn anything down, didn't crack anything, changed the world. Uh, I would like to have the Polynesian people in our community stand up for what's right, but stand up for what's right in the right way and do the things that we need to do and be a good example for our, our keikis, our mo'opunas, our people that are coming up from behind to take our, take our lead. I think it's a, I think it's a important thing that we do and include everybody, include all uh, races, uh, include every, every culture. Um, I think that once we have one voice for good, then, you know, based on love, uh, uh, spiritual love, I think, uh, I don't think we can go wrong. Uh, if you, uh, leave, if you leave the love out, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. So, uh, I appreciate the time and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ekholu. Um, <clears throat> I want to personally thank each and every one of our panelists today for participating in this conversation. Um, I know it was not easy. I know that um, oftentimes when we're very passionate about something, it's, uh, we want to respond and we uh, want to be able to share our feelings. And so I appreciate the space that each of you have has offered to each other. Um, even though there's a whole audience watching, um, this conversation was, was among you all. And so I appreciate the opportunity that you all have allowed us to be able to be a part of this conversation. Um, I want to... Uh, just end by saying that, um, you know, civil unrest is going to continue to happen as long as individuals are feeling marginalized and unheard. And so um, it's important that we figure out what our role is in that. And do we want to start at our home and teach our children? Do we want to go out and be engaged in our local government and run for office? Do we wanna be in the classroom to teach our kids? Do we wanna be on the front line protecting and serving the community? Or do we wanna be on the front line um, to ensure that voices are being heard? Um, we all have different perspectives. We all have uh, ways that we want to engage. But the one thing that I heard from everyone, regardless of perspective, is that there's a lot of love. And, and that we want to definitely lead with love. And our community has been known to be uh, compassionate um, and very passionate. And um, regardless of our size and stature, how many of, of us there is in the collective, um, Pacific Islanders have known to get things done. And I appreciate the fact that I come, that I'm cut from that cloth. Um, I wanna end before we move into the last part of our conference today, is that uh, I want us to think about when we're doing laundry, okay? In order for us to do laundry, we have to stick it into the wash machine. And when you put dirty clothes into the wash machine, you don't just turn on the machine and the water comes and it cleans itself. It actually has to have tension within the wash machine to turn it and to clean it. So I want us to think about that when we're thinking about the work that we do is that sometimes we have to go through some of that tension to get to the clean part. And so that's kind of what we're doing today is we kind of had to go through that tension and hopefully we get to that part where we're all uh, fresh and, and clean and ready to continue to move this work forward. So I wanna end our, our panelists by thanking you, uh, Isi, 
Thank you, Sete. Thank you, Ekolu. Thank you, Jake. And thank you, Irene, so much for uh, being family and being able to engage in this conversation. Um, I want us all to take a deep breath. I want us to just kind of sit still, both feet on the ground. Um, I want us to sit up with our back straight and try to ground ourselves. Um, take a deep, deep breath and exhale. And I want us to do that two more times. So if we can take one big deep breath, hold it and exhale. Another deep breath. And exhale. Thank you.